Ow! Ugh. I bet that hurt. <laughs> and for the Sooners, it's going to hurt if they don't snap out of it. Matter of fact, um, Texas comes in with the momentum in this year's Red River Showdown and a loss to the Longhorns and the Sooners, you know, they could be looking at more losses down the road with still games remaining against Texas Tech, against TCU, Oklahoma State, West Virginia. So, second half of the season does not look like a picnic. So, thing though to keep in mind about football, each and every game you get an opportunity to redeem yourself. In Vegas, they still respect the Sooners because Oklahoma is an eight-point favorite to beat the Longhorns. But again, Texas enters this game with the momentum coming off that overtime win over Kansas State. And by the way, if you look at the Big 12 standings, it, you know, I don't ever remember in this century it happening, but Texas has the better Big 12 record entering this game. But later in the show, we're going to talk about momentum entering um, the Cotton Bowl and the OU Texas game. And sometimes it's not necessarily what it's cracked up to be. This could give Oklahoma an even better shot at getting back into the win column after the embarrassing loss to Iowa State. Look, Sooner fans, I mean, it happened, all right? It seems like a nightmare, but it happened. Sooner's 30-point-plus favorite against Iowa State last Saturday. Yeah, it's reality. They lost. But you can't do anything about it. You can't hop into Doc Brown's DeLorean time machine and set it for October 7th and be able to change history. It doesn't work that way. can't do anything about it except learn from it. And hopefully the Sooners will do just that. Again, the Sooners enter this game as a point favor. Before we break down the Sooners and Longhorns in a very pivotal game this week in the college football, got to talk about the injury situation for the Sooners. Abdul Adams, the um, ankle gave him fits. In fact, his playing time was limited as a result of that ankle injury. But the Sooners do have you know, quality depth in the backfield. I expect Trey Sermon to touch the ball even more. And Marcelli is setting to do the same thing as well. Plus, you still have Rodney Anderson and Dimitri Flowers, sometimes the forgotten back for the Sooners. So I don't think Oklahoma's situation at running back, although it will be affected somewhat by Adams' absence if he does not play, at least you got other guys that can step to the forefront and has been running back by committee after all so far the first five games for the Sooners. Now, looking at other injury situations, C.D. Lamb, well, this was just a tough deal for the Sooners. Last Saturday, scores a touchdown to go up 14 nothing. but, you know, as he's, you know, diving, shoulder, yeah, hits the ground, and that was bad news because we didn't see him after that. He is by far OU's best receiver. And so I don't know if he'll play. I, I know on his, on his Twitter account he says, I'm good. Doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be cleared to play. Doesn't mean that the coaches are going to allow him to play. Um, from what I heard, that shoulder injury was uh, was bad. So uh, bad enough to keep him out of the rest of that Iowa State game. And, and who knows what the real effects of that are. And, again, Lincoln Riley hasn't said if he's going to play. Wouldn't surprise me if he suited up. But it also, too, wouldn't surprise me if he still did not see action. So if he doesn't play, uh, Jeff Bidette would probably become the next big threat. And Bidette's got to hold on to the ball. He's got plenty of speed and talent. He's got to be able to not drop those passes, which – Got him benched in the Iowa State defeat. Um, and by the way, if you're thinking Charleston Rambo, the the uh, red shirt freshman, will they burn his red shirt? I'm not foreseeing that happening at all. I, I just don't think they'll do that. Um, Marquise Brown's got to learn to hold on to the ball, too. Had a big drop in the fourth quarter when OU was down and trying to tie the game and coming across the middle, dropped a pass on third down, and you know that, that really – was a contributing factor in that fourth quarter of misery for the Sooners. Um, so Marquise Brown, he, he's going to be needed as well. Jordan Smallwood. And then we talk, of course, about uh, Mark Andrews, the tight end. Um, so no question, uh, C.D. Lamb is the best receiver for the Sooners. And if he doesn't play, yeah, it will have an effect on the Sooner uh, passing attack. And then Stephen Parker, the safety. Uh, had ankle issues as well. Didn't see action in the second half. And we'll, in a second, talk about the Texas offensive attack, which is primarily going to be throwing the ball. Snap out of it. And the Sooner secondary, that's who better snap out of it because against Iowa State last week, it was undependable, big time. Um, especially Jordan Thomason. Doesn't get much easier this week because you're going against the height of the Longhorn receiver. So about Colin Johnson. Um, six feet, six inches tall, and I'd be willing to bet you they'll line up Johnson on the side of Jordan Thomas. And Thomas, as Mike Stoops 
uh, said this week to the media, I mean, it's not really a question of strategy. It's not X's and O's. It's just playing better. And that's what Mike Stoops said about Jordan Thomas, whose play last week in that second half was terrible. He says he's got to play better. Got to play better. It's that simple. Got to stick with uh, Colin Johnson, whoever uh, Jordan Thomas is lined up. And remember, it's not just Johnson who poses a height advantage for the Longhorns. I mean, they've got Dorian Leonard at six feet, five inches tall, little Jordan Humphrey. Um, he's at 6'5 as well, and you got to deal with the speed of John Bird as well. Texas receivers are pretty good, and of course for the secondary, uh, the OU secondary right now, yeah, not uh, exactly up to snuff. Um, they're uh, giving up 232 yards of passing yards per game, 79th in the country. It would help if the Sooners can get a pass rush, if you know somebody besides Obo can bring pressure, and we'll see how the Sooners front three, and they've gone primarily with the front three this year, which we thought they'd go with the 4-3, but instead it's been a lot of 3-4 uh, look with Oboe rushing on the outside at times. If you can get to the quarterback, which I believe is going to be Sam Ellinger, um, the freshman, I know that Shane Bouchel would be ready to go, and I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, Bouchel play a little bit, but considering that Ellinger has been playing more frequently because of injuries to Michelle and because Ellinger right now looks like more of the complete quarterback. I mean, a passing, running type threat, and running quarterbacks have given Oklahoma fits. I'd be surprised if Ellinger did not start. I'd be really shocked if Ellinger didn't play most of the game. Uh, the Sooners are going to have to be able to make him throw early, bring pressure, take chances, do what you have to do. You can't be sitting ducks, though in that secondary, in that linebacking quarter, because I think Ellinger, what he'll do, he'll lob a lot of passes because he knows that the Texas receivers have that height advantage. So Sooners are going to have to rush Ellinger into throwing early and maybe try to confuse him a bit as well. Rushing game for Texas, it hasn't exactly been stellar. In fact, Ellinger has been the best runner so far for the Longhorns as far as the running threat goes. Um, it's kind of been running back by committee for the Longhorns with uh, Chris Warren, um, as well as um, with their other running backs that they've been using on a rotating basis, uh, guys like Kyle Porter. Um, but Kyle Porter is only averaging three yards a carry. And one guy that could carry the ball a little bit more frequently, even though we haven't seen him much for Texas, is Tennille Carter, who right now is averaging a little, a little more than six yards per carry, even though he's only touched the ball 16 times. So there's really not one running back in particular that just really jumps out on the stat sheet for the Longhorns. I do think they'll go with several, but OU has been very good against the run. So big thing is it wouldn't be a bad thing for the Sooners if they made Texas one-dimensional. I do think Texas will have success through the air, but I'm not convinced that they'll have a lot of success on the ground entering this game. Snap out of it! And perhaps the biggest matchup in this Red River showdown, the OU offensive line, whom they're having a great year. In fact, they played pretty darn well against Iowa State last week. Offensive line for Oklahoma is not the reason why they lost that game. In fact, you make an argument that the Sooners did not run enough behind the offensive line. They didn't do enough running. You're taking on a Texas defensive line, though, that has improved and improved big time since that embarrassing loss to Maryland in the season opener. In fact, you can make an argument that even though Texas won three of their last four games, Texas should be entering the Red River Showdown with a four-game winning streak. They should have beat USC. If you watch that game, the Texas front seven, you know, led by Anthony Wheeler, the terrific linebacker, I mean, he was really getting the job done. Of course, Malik Jefferson, you got experience there in the front of Puna Ford. Those guys did a heck of a job against a supposed explosive USC offense and held them in check. In fact, if it weren't for Texas turnovers, the Longhorns would have come out with a big win. But instead, they won three or four still with the momentum. They won their last two games. And the defensive unit, I think, is a big reason why, especially that front seven. Now, the secondary at times have had their moments for Texas. However, nationally, they rank 97th in the country, giving up almost 250 yards per game. But keep in mind, though, what we saw last week against Iowa State, in which the Cyclones only rushed three and dropped the other eight back trying to prevent the big play, I'd be shocked if Texas did the same thing. To me, that's not the Longhorn style. They're more of a physical, aggressive type defense. They've got the speed, unlike Iowa State, to keep up with OU on the offensive side. I would expect Baker Mayfield to not have as much time to throw. So, that's the not-so-good news. Baker Mayfield's not going to be able to stay in the pocket as long as he wants 
within reason and be able to pick Texas apart. He's going to have to make smart but quicker decisions because I do think Texas will bring the heat. But the good news is that, you know, unlike Sam Ellinger or Shane Bouchel, whoever plays at both plays for Texas, Mayfield obviously has a lot more experience and has played in a lot more big games than these two worthy uh, Texas quarterback opponents. So, Advantage there, perhaps, for the Sooners. The Sooners are going to need to run for at least 145 yards in this game, in my opinion, and get close to that 5 yard per average on the ground. Of course, Texas only gives up 3.3 yards per carry on the ground. So this is going to be a big matchup. The Longhorns only allowing 105 rushing yards per game. So something has got to give in this game because OU averages over 200 yards rushing per game. My final thoughts on this game, as I mentioned earlier, Texas enters this game with momentum, but it's not all it's cracked up to be. If you're looking at this from the Oklahoma perspective, you have to believe that because there's two references that Oklahoma can use that should make themselves feel a little better. Reference number one, Texas in contemporary times. Look, OU entered this game for the last four years with the momentum and looking like the much better team. But in three of the past four years, you know who's outplayed whom? Texas has. Texas took whatever happened, whatever adversity they had in the past, whatever losses, and they didn't let it linger, and they took out their frustrations on OU. It paid off in 2013 and 2015 with upsets. In 2014, it should have been a Texas win, but defense and special teams, big plays on that side of the ball for the Sooners, helped them avert the upset. And last year's game could have gone either way. I was playing on even level, OU winning by a mere five points. So what I'm trying to tell you is that just because one team enters this game with momentum, and looking like, you know what, they can end up pulling off the victory. Remember, you hit the reset button because robbery games, you throw everything out. Again, Oklahoma can't do anything about Iowa State. You snap out of it, and you get ready for this particular game. Texas, right now, the momentum shoes are on their feet. But when it comes to entering this game, as we've just proven, it doesn't always translate into a W, as Oklahoma has found out. Now the shoe's on their foot. Another point of reference, Oklahoma needs to look at one program, themselves. Because check this out. The Sooners, each of the last seven years, have had one loss in which they were a double-digit favorite, including this year where it was the biggest Sooner upset loss of all to Iowa State, which is still hard to fathom, but it happened. As a matter of fact, 11 of the last 13 years, OU has lost a game in which they were a double-digit favorite. So this is nothing new. But... That's not what really completely defines you. What defines you is how you respond the following game. And only one time in that stretch did the Sooners lose as a double-digit favorite and then get beat the following week. And that was in 2014 when they lost to OSU and then the Russell Athletic Bowl to a Clemson team that was just far better. So what I'm trying to say is that just because you have a stunning loss doesn't mean that it has to linger to the next week. And historically, in contemporary times, OU has responded like champions and have won the following week. In fact, OU has not had back-to-back -back regular season losses since 1999. So, I'm going to say OU wins, okay? And I'm going to say to cover the spread, which right now is at 8, 35-24, OU gets back on track. Won't be easy. And I do think Ellinger, who I do believe will play almost all the snaps, I think he's going to be a fine future quarterback for, this, for the Longhorns if he's not already. But Baker Mayfield's the better QB. Oklahoma's the better team. But I think the big, big difference, OU will be able to control the clock with a ground attack that will do just enough to keep Texas's offense off the field as much as possible. 35-24, the Sooners to get back on the winning streak with still some bigger games down the road, but you got to take care of this one first. Post game of OU Texas will not be until late. Um, that's just the way it goes. Probably will be sometime Sunday. So if OU loses and Texas fans are wondering where I'm at, not having a post game, well, I'm telling you right now, it's going to be early Sunday. That's just the way it lays out. All right. So don't think I won't do a post game because Lord willing, I will. Don't forget my three picks, which I'll have. Um, later on on this very web page. Boomer Sooner.